Joining us now is Oji Ope with stories trending around the world. Hello, Oji. Good morning, Dr. Amati. <laughs> How was your weekend? Yeah, yes. I, fantastic. Yes. Good morning, Good Arty. morning, Leila. Great, Leila. To, see you, Great to see you, too. Good morning to you, viewers. We begin what's trending in Nigeria. As the weekend marked the end of Ramadan, Muslims across the globe turned out in numbers to observe the commemoration of Eid al Fitr. In Kano State, despite having the second highest COVID 19 cases in the country, photos of worshippers flouting social distancing rules circulated on social media. On Sunday, during the Eid prayers led by the chief imam of Kano, the governor of the state, Abdullahi Ganduje, and those around him appeared to have observed some social distancing rules. However, a crowd of religious faithful that gathered behind a glass partition at the venue flouted all forms of social distancing. Photos posted by the governor's media aide had many Twitter users outraged. Let's take some reaction. One user wrote, these photos show how life is in most northern states. The elites do not care about what happens to the common man. First, they are demarcated as if, they're not this, if it's not the same God everyone's serving. The outcasts are not practicing social distancing. They can die if they want. Another user wrote, the worst is that those clamped together like sardines on the other side of the glass believe they deserve to be treated that way. If they were human beings with dignity, they would have left the place in protest of such arrant display of inequality, even in the house of God. Finally, a user wrote, the whole point of Salah is to make everyone of different social standings stand before Allah as equals. But you've separated the rich from the poor, and may Allah deal with you people for it. I think those last two tweets really and truly highlights it. People not even knowing or understanding their rights, actually feeling like they're lesser than these people on the other side of the glass, and then defeating the entire purpose of Salah itself, and actually putting it in that huge display of inequality and throwing it in our faces. Quite frankly, I think this is one of the most absurd showings that we have seen so far. Correct. In any case, what we saw uh, yesterday at the uh, prayer grounds in those states where the governor said that people uh, could congregate was uh, clearly a violation of the guidelines that have been given. The congregation, uh, according to the presidential task force, anywhere should not have more than a gathering of 20 persons. Yes. And in Kano, in uh, Niger State and elsewhere, uh, nobody bothered about this. Now, if you look at the video that you are showing, some persons there are wearing face masks. Some are not even wearing any face masks at all. At all. And then people are not observing physical distance. What can we can take from this is that, look, as uh, Boss Mustafa pointed out uh, in one of the briefings last week, if we're not careful, we could have numbers, you know, increasing exponentially in Nigeria. In not just in Kano and elsewhere, yes. where people are still in denial about the uh, fact of uh, COVID-19. I think we'd like to see a lot more from the state governors uh, taking COVID-19 more seriously. we also like to see a lot more in terms of public enlightenment, as it is. It looks like we have to keep repeating the information yes. before yeah. many Nigerians will realize that what they're dealing with uh, is a pandemic and that the only way uh, to uh, avoid it, to keep safe, is to just follow the basic precautions that have been outlined uh, by those who know. But the thing is, is this is the um, tradition there. This is the same thing that they do every year. So I know that it's really difficult for them to, you know, but observe these rules. Thing, all but across the world. It's yes, all across you're the right. World. I, saw, at, I saw yeah. photos of, you know, the um, celebrations across Africa. I believe it was just Sudan that, you know, there were a lot of people. Senegal. Senegal, Senegal I remember. Yes, yeah, Senegal. It was mm -hmm. amazing. There were a lot of people yeah. there. And how hard can it be for you to observe that? But you that? predicted this. Last week when you were on the show yes. and we were discussing this, we literally said that Regardless, the reality is here in Nigeria, so long as you say the, the lockdown has been eased and you can go to mosque and you can pray and you can celebrate well, then, then they think that the virus so long is over. As you has, as, as, so long as you have said that, you have given way and room to the flouting of every guideline that you can think of. You cannot expect in otherwise. Sa in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a place that uh, many Nigerians look up to and they go yes. frequently to Mecca and Medina. In Mecca and Medina, there were eight prayers. There were no worshippers in the mosque. Yeah. People were told to stay at home. How difficult and can they that be? At home. It's a very simple 
piece of advice. Now then, the worry right now is that Super these spread. numbers are going to spike in Kano, especially just from these images yeah. that you see out there. And the fact is, I don't understand what the demarcation is all about at this point. I thought they were all supposed to be well, together. Well, Kano is already the second epicenter well, the, of the virus. The demarcation, and, I yes. don't know, uh, you know, uh, the yeah. exact venue, I've not been there. But sometimes when you have VIPs, yes. uh, you have uh, the general crowd, that glass you see there is just for security reasons, mm. so that the ordinary people do not overwhelm uh, the people in the VIP uh, section. Because uh, it just happens. that important. If you go to uh, a number of these uh, stadiums, you will see what they call the state box. But I don't know what the configuration of that particular pray, pray, praying ground is. Well, I mean, it's been a topic but of discussion. The consideration will be security. Yes. You, know, you don't want, uh, if you look at the people in the uh, background, you could see if they have too much access to the VIPs, you know. Why I didn't see it? that. I'm sure they have VIPs in Senegal. But you know that. why? So, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I did not see that happening in Senegal. Mm. So, I mean, I, I think I, it's just, it's just, just wrong, to be yes. honest. And I think it's become so imbibed in our culture to, to really and truly justify these acts. It's wrong, quite frankly. That is a display of inequality that you don't want to see anywhere well, in this world. Inequality is there, even in church. Yeah, of you course know, it's there. But, special, special uh, section for <laughs> yes, but these are your the leaders. Church. These are your leaders. Yeah. allowing you to possibly get extremely sick and possibly lose your life behind it's, the demarcation exactly. because they're okay. Exactly. We cannot argue with that and say it's acceptable. It is yeah. just wrong. Well, well, we can talk about, you know, COVID-19 and the need to take precautions, mm -hmm. but there will always be class, you know, distanciation. Classism, classism exists in every single society. You won't go to church society. and sit in the front row. I Classism do. exists in every... <laughs> why not? Why not? <laughs> If, why not? Reserved, if it is reserved, okay. put it there. Well, that this has been reserved. All right. Uh -huh. Point taken. <laughs> <laughs> well, still in Nigeria, as President Mohamedou Buhari observed this year's Eid with his family members at Asa Rock on Sunday, Nigerians had mixed reactions about the family photographs that circulated on social media. During prayers, the First Lady Aisha Buhari and her children observed social distancing, and some of them wore face masks in line with the safety protocol of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. The president, however, had no face mask on and was sitting on a chair as others knelt down while listening to the imam's preachings. Well, let's take some reactions before we come back for a discussion. Well, some users defended why Buhari was sitting while others knelt. One user, Tunde, wrote, I am not a, P a supporter of the PDP or APC, but as a Muslim, this is permissible when you are old or young and have knee or back issues or sick in any way that can cause more harm if you kneel down or don't have the strength at all due to sickness. Another user, Shitu, wrote, it is allowed. Sometimes you might not be too all right for prayer, and you are expected to observe prayer at those times. So Allah gave his servant opportunity to worship from the sitting position. It isn't a big deal. Finally, a user wrote, sitting while praying is permissible in Islam, but almost everyone, on this, uh, is, miss any everyone is missing the point on this thread. If Buhari can be praying with a chair, he is definitely too old. To rule. I can't believe that sitting while praying has actually become a topic, a topic of, conversation of conversation on social yes. media. I mean, across any sphere of life, it's just common yes. sense. If I'm praying with my grandma, would I expect my grandma to get down on her two knees onto the floor Correct. after knee surgeries and all and be praying on the floor? Yes. If she was in church, would I expect her to go down onto the floor or would she be one of those people that would sit on the chair and pray on the chair? This is actually in conversation. Wow. Now, yes, yeah, it, it is a conversation. I know. I mean, the fact <laughs> that people are ignorant about that aspect of, oh, you know, my. older people can and mm -hmm. sit on the chair while the prayers are going on. It's really baffling. Not but even just older people, pregnant women, pregnant, yes. people with disabilities, but, come on. But the conversation went further. You know, the issue of um, President Buhari not wearing a face mask has been an issue with everyone, yeah. as, opposed, as, as well as other world leaders like Donald Trump, who does not wear a face mask well, in public. Well, I think the presidency you know? already addressed that, yeah. the point about uh, whether he wears a face mask or not, and the precautions that the presidency uh, takes. Uh, in the restricting the access to him. But the point about him sitting down is good, you brought the story. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the people who are Muslims, uh, they have made the point that it's no big deal. Yes. It's, it's permissible. Uh, after all, people go to church and they sit down. You know, it's not about how you worship your God. You know, it's Thank a you. personal thing between you and your God. Correct. And that's what is important, not mm -hmm. the mode of uh, presentation, whether you are kneeling down or you are sitting down. Yes. And to the extent that 
It's not compulsory that you uh, squat uh, while praying the Muslim way. Right. The president has not done anything wrong. I, mean, I don't think and so. don't forget the fact that he's 77. Right. So uh, the Islamic religion is liberal in terms of, you know, people who may be sick, people who are elderly, people yeah. who may not, uh, you know, uh, be in a condition to follow the uh, necessary uh, standard uh, popular protocols. Yeah. I particularly mm. loved the photographs. If we could pull those off, the photographs of the, the family. I really loved everything. I think it sets such a good example. Yes. I mean, look how fun that looks with the selfie and uh, the front but, page of this day yes, today it was as well. on the front page, yes. I particularly mm. really loved that they I think come out and they take the yeah. pictures and they remind people that, you know, you gather as a family. And I think that he really showed example, really, with this whole Eid prayers in his home. As Nobody opposed, should come and visit yes. me. You kept to you and your family Correct. and you led by example this is what we yes. were saying with mr fenny okay. earlier where he said it's example and not leadership but you have to lead by example and that that is i guess what the president did i mean people are always going to have their complaints Correct. and those complaints will come up and to be fair they are valid you can ask why the president is not wearing a face mask but at the end of the day um i think what we've seen here is a good display of um leading by example and we can't and really i absolutely agree with you uh, yes family man correct you know a soft side of him like yes. many people he looks so happy look at that smile no, he always smiles so nice <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's take our ni uh, next story still in Nigeria. The chairman of Nigeria's in diaspora, Abike Dabiri Erawa, over the weekend alleged that her staff were sent out of an assigned Nigerian Communications Commission office by armed men on the orders of Isa Pantami, Minister of Communications and Digital Economy. The minister denied the allegations, saying that the NCC has responded to the lies by Ms. Abike Dabiri. Ms. Dabiri, however, stood her ground and alleged that the minister treated her commission in such a manner because she is a woman. Well, let's take a quick listen. One year, we don't even have an office. The office we got, uh, given to us by NCC, we're actually driven away by the Honorable Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, <laughs> Mr. Isa Pantami. Within two days, he drove us out with guns. And what happened? The place was given to us by NCC. You know, we all help each other. NCC, as an agency of government, said there's a place you can to settle in. And just as we settled in, I was in Ethiopia when I got a call. And I thought it was well, accommodation can be a challenge, uh, oftentimes in Abuja. You may have, it is not impossible to have an agency. And don't forget that this Nigeria Diaspora Commission, uh, you know, was only uh, first established by President Buhari, and Abike Dabri is the first director general. So it's not impossible that, you know, such a new uh, agency may not immediately have accommodation. And I guess she must have looked for space, and the Nigeria Communications Commission at that time will have given her space. Now, there is a new person in charge of the ministry, uh, Issa Pantami, uh, and then you have this ugly situation whereby NITCOM, which is also a very strategic agency, is claiming that people came to the building with guns and evicted uh, the staff. But the uh, SEC, has a different uh, explanation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The NCC had pointed out that uh, in that building, uh, there was going to be an audit uh, by, uh, or a visit by the president, and that they needed to ensure that persons who have offices there are persons that they can properly identify now, and that the soldiers were there just to secure the place, whatever. <laughs> whatever the truth is, what then happened between uh, Abike Dabri and Dr. Pantani I think was ugly because the two of them now went on their Twitter accounts. Yes. And they were, you know, exchanging uh, words uh, back and forth. I think, you know, that's a, a bit untidy yeah. because it shows that, you know, there's some kind of dissonance, there is no cooperation, and everybody who has been given an appointment uh, by the president of Nigeria uh, is exercising delegated authority. If the job of such person, male or female, is to help government achieve its objectives and assist the president in providing the leadership that is required. Now, if you now have two officials mm -hmm. uh, in different arms of government quarreling and exposing their quarrel uh, on Twitter, then, of course, it's on time. But, however, this is not the first time this has happened. You have ministers fighting over territory, uh, over who should be in charge of what.
But I'm sure that this will be uh, amicably uh, resolved. Yes. Uh, particularly now that it is in the uh, public in the public domain. domain. Yes. And I'm though. sure that the office of the uh, secretary to the government of federation, uh, which is uh, partly the, the which is the office that is uh, responsible in one sense for the allocation of uh, office space, uh, sometimes in collaboration with the uh, Federal Capital Territory Authority, uh, will resolve this and ensure that uh, Abike Daviri and her team are not thrown out onto the uh, streets of uh, Abuja. So I have yeah, a question, though. Should it, should it take, in any case whatsoever, and you've worked in government, should it take two years to find a way to accommodate a commission? I mean, the Diaspora Commission is not a small commission. Absolutely they have been involved not. in Correct. a lot of work since their inception. Yes. Should it really take? Is there any reason it should take two years and well, you still don't have an office? Well, it's not that uh, it has taken uh, two years. I mean, the commission itself is just one year old. Pardon me. Um, and in this particular case, they already give them an office. She herself said they were given... Uh, a floor by the uh, uh, NCC, and that's where they've been using, right? But the owner of the property is the NCC. Yeah. Now, what you may say is, well, should they have their own headquarters? Should they have their own uh, uh, so, building assigned so to them? So the point is, they don't have an office now. They have been driven out of their office. No, well, I'm sure that with the, the, uh, the altercation... That's what she's saying. No, that will be resolved. It yeah. will be resolved. I just see it as a minor disagreement. It's not as if NCC is saying that they, want, they don't want them to use that space again. Some communication problem. I'm sure they but this constant it. lack of coordination and this but why in the first place would, It's a, such a strong allegation. Why in the first place should that happen? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at this point for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. It's a bit, yeah, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered here, certainly. Yes, but they will resolve it. They will resolve it. All right. The Diaspora Commission is an important uh, agency. Yes. So if there is free space that they have borrowed mm. from the NCC, and it's not as if NCC wants to use that space. She's complaining that those... everything is quite challenging for her right now. She has no computer. And she brought she gender no into death. it and said it's because yes. she's a woman, which right. quite frankly also can't be debunked. That's, a, well, that's I mean, number one. I'm sure Abike Dabri herself, having been in uh, government for quite a long time, will know that you know, there are channels through which she can uh, process her grievances uh, to be addressed. Because we're talking about government. Mm -hmm. you know? So the externalization of it is not what will solve the problem. Okay. You know, going through the uh, normal channels, through the office of the uh, secretary to the government of the federation. Being proactive and not reactive. the Federal Capital Territory Authority uh, that may be in charge of a number of buildings. That's how to solve the problem. He and uh, she and uh, Mantami should just sheet their thoughts. Yes, absolutely. Very well said. Let's head over to Tanzania now, where the country's president, John Magufili, has said that the number of COVID-19 patients in hospitals is declining, although the government has not released data on the infection rates for many weeks. According to reports, the president has repeatedly downplayed the risk of the pandemic, causing alarm among neighboring African countries and international organizations. The government even urged Tanzanians to dedicate three days for Thanksgiving over the weekend, as they say they are beating the virus. Earlier this month, the U.S. Embassy in Tanzania issued an alert warning that many hospitals in the city had been overwhelmed in recent weeks. You know, I have a lot of questions <laughs> to ask here. Wasn't it Tanzania as well that yeah. was, it was the Tanzanian president who came out to say that he sent in COVID-19 yes. tests on a popo, yeah. on a goat. Um, one was from Petrol Labby yeah. and something else. And, that and then there was a goat that came that back tested positive. positive. The popo yes. tested positive, etc. Right. And was he was basically president. trying to look at the fallacious side to COVID-19. Now, I think it's a bit... It's a bit too soon to start getting ahead of yourself, seeing a reduction and saying that, OK, we're going to start relaxing lockdowns, especially when you're bordered by countries that have existing cases. At the end of the day, no government right now should be that free, I don't think. Yeah, but the point is there have not been any reports from Tanzania, like I just read. Well, and, for example, the neighboring countries like Kenya, mm. they're saying that the number of troops, people that are coming into Kenya from Tanzania are testing are positive for COVID-19. About 100 last week tested positive Another for leader in denial. COVID-19. COVID well, what, uh, what they have in Tanzania is uh, what, uh, you know, this famous professor has described as the magufulization <laughs> of Tanzania. Uh, President Magufuli came into power with a lot of promise. But we have also seen that uh, there is another side to him, you know, a tendency to uh, behave like a dictator. Mm -hmm. But with regard to uh, COVID-19, uh, what happened was that as at uh, April 21, um, Tanzania had over 400 uh, cases. 
and about uh, 22 deaths. And then by May, there was additional report of 29 cases from, uh, uh, from Zanzibar, which is an island territory yes. uh, in Tanzania. Now, the president now decided that, look, it was those numbers were causing panic among the people. And since April 21, there has been no further announcement of any COVID-19 cases in uh, Tanzania which is the reason why the neighboring countries, including Kenya and Uganda, you know, are so concerned. Yeah. And Kenya and Uganda, they are both practically shut down their borders with uh, Tanzania because many of the uh, uh, people uh, who use the trade route uh, between those countries have been seen to have been uh, positive. So clearly, President Magufuli's government is underplaying the outbreak of the pandemic Boosting in Tanzania, the infodemic. even when he himself confessed that one of his sons uh, tested positive for COVID-19, but that had been treated, according to him, with lemon and ginger, <laughs> and that he had recovered. Now, medical doctors in uh, Tanzania are also concerned. Health workers are concerned. Yeah. But they cannot speak up mm -hmm. because yes, there are draconian afraid. repressive yeah. laws yes. against freedom Very of expression. Very dictatorial. And that's why is the U.S. Embassy that you referred to uh, mm -hmm. having to uh, issue a statement to say that the risk in the Dar es Salaam alone is uh, extremely, extremely high. Yeah. So that's the situation in uh, Tanzania, but I hope that the neighboring countries and the international community will put pressure. They should look into it. I mean, it's, it's very scary. The danger alone of just withholding information from your own citizens and giving them a situation report, a daily situation report in the middle of a pandemic, the dangers of that alone. Talk less of the dangers that you can potentially cause to everybody else around you. I just think it's highly irresponsible. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the Africa Center for Disease Control, you know, is already calling out uh, Tanzania. Yes, they are. And saying that Tanzania should give an update on the uh, figures because... What the, the real danger is that, you know, President Magufuli may not have again allowed testing. But what does he have to gain, so though? That's what test, I don't understand. What does he have to gain? gain? What do you have to gain no, if you I have to gain? I told his explanation. He it's, said, it's, uh, it's causing uh, panic. <laughs> among the Meanwhile, people. he's what increasing panic. You're, causing, you're increasing panic. Yeah, facts with over fear. The yes. only way you can debunk fear is by presenting your people with the facts. If you don't present your people with the facts, you will automatically cause fear. So even just can't even the logic behind what he has done is so nonsensical. Well, Leila, maybe you will support this. Uh, President Magufuli's mm. uh, solution now. Now, mm. is to say that this week uh, religious leaders uh, in Tanzania uh, should uh, fast for about three days and that on Sunday this week uh, there will be a national Thanksgiving uh, targeted at uh, COVID-19. Yeah, that's what I just read. Over the weekend they did that's, that as well. That's, that's, his, that's his version of a situation <laughs> report, I mean. No problem. Good luck to him and his people. <laughs> I am just, I am just, I am just what shocked. A shocker. A lot, yeah, I'm really shocked. Oh, my. Really. <laughs> All right, let's head over to the U.S. now. On Sunday, the New York Times filled its front page with the names of those who have died from the novel coronavirus. Over the weekend, many users on social media reacted to the cover and shared their condolence. Nearly 1,000 names and obituaries in memory of the dead replaced the usual articles, photographs, and graphics of the newspaper. The assistant editor of the paper's graphics desk, Simone Landon, said she and her colleagues decided to compile the list when they realized that there was a bit of fatigue with the data of the victims that have lost their lives to COVID-19. This comes as the U.S. approached the grim milestone of 100,000 coronavirus fatalities. Dr. Abati, there is your social media. I Such pulled one of yours because yeah. a lot of people posted. Oh, yes. I got yes. goosebumps yes. when I saw this yesterday. Yes. It gave me goosebumps. So touching. Um, really, really, really touching. And it kind of just it, it put the reality in your face way more than it's already been in your face. And it really made you think about the depth of what we've had to go through so far and what we're still going to go through. There's so much loss of life that can't be accounted for. It's unimaginable. And kudos to the New York Times for doing Absolutely. this. Absolutely. I think the design of the uh, front page of the New York Times is, uh, you know, quite dramatic, quite amazing, very innovative. Uh, a lot of people commended it from the point of view of uh, graphics. Mm. And the team that put that together um, was led by uh, the deputy graphics editor, yes. Simone, uh, Simone Landon. Landon. Yeah. And a researcher was engaged, uh, Alain uh, de la Quay Riel, uh, who selected those 1,000 names from obituary notices across the uh, Country. And this will be the first time in more than 40 years that uh, the New York Times will have its uh, front page without an image. Yes, mm -hmm. first you know, time. An all-type uh, 
yeah. graphics, uh, you know, approach. And it continued inside uh, the 1,000 names. And then it was supported with uh, an opinion yeah. by an uh, economist, uh, Dambari, uh, who wrote a short piece to contextualize this about the names involved yes. and to bring the fact of COVID-19 uh, to everyone in a very uh, grim uh, uh, manner. In the, in, the, in the United States where, you know, they have uh, cases of deaths uh, running into about uh, 100,000. Yes. And the infected uh, infection rate of over 1 million and with New York as the uh, epicenter. There couldn't have been a better way of reminding people and keeping the record mm -hmm. of how the Grim Reaper mm -hmm. has used COVID-19 yes, like as a vehicle word, Grim uh, Grim for Reaper. devastating right. our communities. And to remind us when, that we're not numbers, but we're not, names. We're not exactly what I was just going to say. When I read some of those obituaries, I, I was moved to tears when I read some of those. May, may their souls rest in peace. Really, really sad Honestly, and may we continue to remember world. and keep in touch with humanity and yes. the fact that this is something affecting us all, you know? This was a great piece. Right. Well, let's take our final story, shall we? Yes. Under entertainment. Still in the U.S., the anticipation of the 15th season of America's Got Talent show. Simon Cowell shared an addition of a singer who was wrongfully convicted for 37 years. It moved the judging panel and members of the audience to tears. Well, let's take a quick look. Just incarcerated for 37 years for somebody else crying. Ooh. <laughs> DNA freed me. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, my God. On the morning of December the 9th of 1982, a 30-year-old white woman was raped and stabbed in her home. I was arrested on January the 4th. I couldn't believe it was really happening. I knew I was innocent. I didn't commit a crime. But being a poor black kid, I didn't have the economic ability to fight the state of Louisiana. I was sentenced to life in 80 years without the possibility of parole or probation. They're trying to digest the freedom that I have right now. I watched America Got Talent in prison, and I would visualize myself being there. I always desired to be on a stage like this. And now I'm here. Thank God. I know it's my chance of a lifetime. Don't let the sun go down on me. But losing everything is like the sun going down on me. Wow. I mean, wow. I would never hear that song the same way again. I mean, that song, yeah. that, that performance just brought a but new two meaning quick things, you know, to that song. Uh, this is not the only case of miscarriage of justice yeah. uh, that we have seen either in the United States or elsewhere. And, uh, you know, the story has a happy ending. Uh, and that in itself uh, is uh, inspirational. And he never gave up hope. He said in a part of that video that even while he was in prison, he didn't see himself as a prisoner no. because he believed that he was free and that he had hope in his mind and his yes. mind was uh, free. Yes. And he was asked, you know, uh, what will he want to do? He said, we will want to sing. Even in prison, he was singing and he was using music uh, as a way of uh, strengthening himself psychologically and of uh, liberating uh, himself. So. Uh, congratulations to him, 37 years. I mean, years. he was sentenced to 80 years to life. Can and, you imagine and the And another thing is that it was technology that built him DNA out. testing. I DNA mean, testing. imagine Advanced if that technology, never happened. You know, and then they checked the fingerprints again. Uh, mm -hmm. You know those things they call code files? Somebody took another look at the code files and... And that's how he he's was. He's now a free man. Yes. And he's... And all of that talent mm -hmm. locked up. And yes. he's doing what... He's using the rest of his life to actually focus on what he's been... Has been ridded... He's, has been taken away from him for so long. Now, this is an extremely touching story. Yes. I'm going to go home and watch the rest of his interview. Yes, audition, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Leila. what's trending today. Thank you, Dr. Matamara. See you tomorrow.